You know, our speaker last year um, was a man that uh, challenged us with the whole idea of what does it mean for us to be a people who uh, walked in the grace that's afforded to us because of the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And uh, he wanted to be with us here again this week and to just enjoy our time uh, as, his, uh, as his friend and uh, colleague uh, brought the messages to us. But he had some more important things, and so he just wanted to uh, share with you guys uh, before John comes and speaks to us. And so this is Bill Thrall from last year. Hey, guys. Last year was just amazing to me. But you know what? Sometimes we've got to do what we've got to do. Well, you guys are up there again this year. One of my best friends, John Lynch, is coming up to share with you. You're going to have an amazing time with him. If there's a difference between us, I just want you to know he's a but I have to go ahead and do what i got to do. So, listen, uh, let me just tell you guys, have a great time, and maybe I'll come back another time. See you guys later. Bye-bye now. Oops, yeah, that's Bill. After we got done last year here at Roundup, I had the privilege of uh, spending three days uh, fishing up in Washington with him. And... Uh, uh, I think he actually loves fishing almost as much as he loves Jesus, but uh, it was a great time with him. Well, this year it is our privilege to have John Lynch with us. Uh, John is a co-author um, with Bill in uh, a number of works. One, Bose Cafe, that uh, many of you have read, uh, Behind the Mask, as well as True Face. He was also a part of The Ascent of a Leader, which was the, uh, the book that uh, we began with here in the Northwest reading about grace-based leadership. And uh, uh, I've had the privilege of spending um, now a number of times with John and getting to know John. He is really uh, an incredible person. The thing, though, that I uh, want you to capture as John comes is he comes with a shepherd's heart as he is the pastor of um, teaching pastor at the Open Door Fellowship in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, so I think you're going to come to love this man and enjoy him as much as I have. John, come and minister the word. Did you like Bill Thrall last year? <laughs> then I may tell you he is my friend. <laughs> but there are subtle differences between Bill and myself. Um, he is wise um, and insightful and discerning. Me, not so much. I think things that should not be thought. Um, like yesterday, I'm, I'm walking my golden retriever Bailey and there's a fly uh, buzzing in my ear and he won't go away and I'm, I'm on my walk and I, I think he'll go away in a moment but he doesn't he stays with me and he's buzzing <laughs> just bugging me I go for two blocks and he's buzzing and finally I stop and I actually say these words out loud you know you're never gonna see your family again <laughs> I mean, you think about it, in, in fly distance, he's gone like 340 miles, you know. <laughs> like me following a giant, you know, and just yelling at him and tapping at him, a 700-foot giant, and finding out that I'm in Quebec, you know. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff that maybe separates me from Bill a little bit. <laughs> hey, a lot of testosterone in this room. So, for you in particular, with you in mind, I wrote this, a tribute to every man.
I can field dress an elk with a butter knife in the dead of winter. <laughs> and fashion a serviceable belt out of its entrails. Because I'm a man. I can perfectly grill a 24-ounce ribeye using an acetylene torch, wrap it with a Slim Jim and onion straws, and serve it as an appetizer. Because I'm a man. I can bore out cylinders on a stock 66 Camaro using a belt sander while hammering the remaining metal, metal shavings into decorative side paneling. I can fart, light it, and tell a joke about French politicians all at the same time. Because I'm a man. I pee in my backyard in the middle of the night just because I can. Because we're men. I can catch a trophy bass using a piece of rope, some barbed wire, and a can of lima beans. I can smoke a Cuban double wrap Cohiba Maduro down to a stub in the time it takes to say Cuban double wrap Cohiba Maduro. <laughs> My fantasy football team can beat yours without a running back. <laughs> I can blow the top off a tin can or a prairie dog with equal accuracy and conscience. I can pop the lid on a stuck jar of mayonnaise with my bare hands while younger men bang it on the side of a counter <laughs> because I have old man strength. <laughs> I see that hand, thank you. <laughs> when convicted hardened criminals get out on parole, they use my man cave as a retreat center just to get their vibe back. <laughs> Because I'm a man. And finally, when Chuck Norris gets down and needs to be inspired, he writes about me. <laughs> I don't get to use that every Sunday at church. <laughs> You guys, now listen. The trick is to never let one bit of that go, but not make the mistake of thinking that who I am as a man in any sense of machismo or anything else can ever solve my spiritual stuff. Because if we're not careful, we'll make the mistake of somehow thinking that our disciplined manhood is what will defeat our issues. And speakers and well-intended mentors will appeal to it. Man, it's time to go to battle. And by that, they mean try harder, make more promises, do more, do less wrong, manage your sin, drum up better behaviors by caring more and get angry at yourself and beat yourself up and discipline up and accountability up. and you will fail and you will feel trapped and you will learn to hide and you will sin more the harder you try not to and you will eventually despair and then eventually you'll get cynical and callous and internally anesthetized and you will begin to imagine Jesus as the one who's trying to force you into this bondage and he is not we're jocks we didn't know any better, but this life in Christ is not lived out by the same methods that you would use to stay in shape or lose weight. It is way too small a thing to identify ourselves anymore as a self-made man or independent or self-sufficient or individually strong or an outsider or quietly mysterious or better than or above or more together or more on your game or an outlaw or a rough rider or intimidating or leveraging or even successful. We're done 
it is time that we are done being insecure boys, trying to cover our shame by proving and competing and comparing on the level of bigger and faster and stronger and smarter and better and more competent and more disciplined and richer and who has the most toys. We're done. According to Jesus, a man is a completely dependent God truster. And it is less important to such a man that he ever fixes anything, but that he learns to trust the one who can solve everything. We'll be talking about this this weekend. He is a shameless love giver and love receiver. He is a humble self-revealer. He is an intimately known friend. He is a weakness boaster. He boasts about his weakness so that God can be glorified in him. He's a convinced free man who obeys from his freedom. All so that he can be a tender protector. Tomorrow night, we're going to walk that journey of what does it look like to protect others. I'll show you a video of my own daughter in there. He is the one who refuses to go passive when those he influences need his heart and his presence and his love as an attention, all so that he can be a grace extender and a vulnerable pursuer. He is the first to forgive. He is the first to tell on himself so that he can receive from God the privilege and gift of being a trusted influencer. and a God glorifier. And that's what a man is. And that's who you men are. And we're going to get to woo that out to come and play this weekend. Guys, if you have Bibles with you, open to Hebrews chapter 12. Tonight I want to... Um, Get a sense of orientation for you to be able to go back with a small group tonight and say, man, I really identified at this place in the journey. I really see myself there. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance and every sin which can so easily entangle us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The race that is every single day custom and uniquely set before us each of us from a God who has known our heart from before the world began. Keep, as soon as you realize you've been entangled, keep fixing your eyes on this Jesus who found you. The author and protector, a perfecter of faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross despising the shame so that he could take on mine and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. You, you know the picture, right? It's a, it's a, you're looking at a stadium full of fans and friends and past runners and they're cheering on one that they respect and admire and love as he or she runs this long distance race. There's a runner in there. There's a coach preparing his runner for the eventuality that along the course he'll get fatigued and confused and disoriented and he'll, he'll experience blinding pain or betrayal and it'll feel like all the rules have changed. And what was once so clear will become foggy and your mind will start telling you lies so that you'll stop the pain. 
And then you will allow yourself, you actually will sabotage your race. You, you will get weighed down with thoughts that could actually cause you to stop running. And the coach is telling his runner how to get home. And then you discover this is not about runners at all. It's about right now, right here. It's about what you're smack dab in the middle of in real time, in your real life, that you just came from and will go back to. Each of us, do you, do you know that before the world began, Jesus Christ designed a race to be run by every single one of us men whose course is personally and uniquely measured out by our best friend and Lord Jesus Christ, it is the singularly most important reason you are still on this earth. It's a lifelong race. It's a beautiful, fulfilling, majestic course. But the very nature of this race factors in broken dreams and loss and, uh, that springs from fear and self-doubt and cowardice that its pain can bring. And I'm convicted that one of the greatest hindrances to running this race, well, is our lack of awareness that we're even in one. Thoreau once said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. And, in, and listen to this. this is, here's the part we don't always hear. And they go to the grave with the song still in them. It's easy to see this life wrong, that there isn't a race, that we go to heaven so we just be good, I guess, and make money and keep from being bored and believe in God and gets what's yours. We see a race, but we see it as a secret competition with each other to prove my goodness and superior way of living. So what is this? It's not a race to earn salvation. It's not a race to compete with each other or to prove your worth. It's not a race to pile up more rewards than the other person. This is a race to have your life count by getting to enjoy and glorify the God and to be able to be loved and love those who he puts in your path. This God who found you sitting on the floor in an abandoned warehouse staring into space. The running of this race is the most precious, holy, courageous endeavor we get to do on this planet. It's what separates us from every other creature, from the system of death of every pretend God. And to the extent that I, that you, that we together own this race, I experience a life worth living and I get to see the world change. You wake up every day, you guys, and it's there. It's going to be there tomorrow morning, I promise you. The sun's going to rise and you're going to go, what did you do? What have you got? What did you set out during the night? What have you prepared for me today? There's never a chance. There's never a mistake. It's never random. There's never a time where God goes, I don't know, just fill some time, will you? <laughs> I got the whole Iraq thing going and, you know, like I got time to worry about your little race, right? No. He knows every single moment, and he knows what's going to happen and what conversation's going to happen. He marks out the course, and so we lace up our shoes and we run. We run into the events and encounters that he's already put in place for us to discover. None of it's to chance, and he trains us as we go. It is an incredible maturity for a man to go from, why did God get in the way, or why did he do this to me, or why didn't he allow this to work? To instead seeing life, as Ephesians 2.10 says. For we, you and I, we're his workmanship. When he wants to show off to the angels what this whole thing was about, he said, look, this is my kid. Created in Christ Jesus to get to do wonderful, beautiful, lifting up, encouraging, life-changing, freeing, taking bondage away from slaves this kind of stuff. Which, listen, which God prepared beforehand so that we would wake up and walk into them. Whew. What do you have today? I'll be watching. I know no moments... 
unplanned or random. This is all customly designed for the race you have for me to run. Live your life through me. There's not anything in this world more than I want to happen than what you think should happen. Do you guys know that you have a new heart, a new nature? You're a new creation, and this is what the real you longs for. This is that unsettled feeling that can never quite get filled in any other way. It is the quest of the real me. What's this race we're running? I love it. This, I, I think almost every time I read this verse, I, I am tempted to cry. It's Acts 20, 24, where he says, where Paul says, I, you know what? I don't consider my life of any account as dear to myself. I just want to finish this course in the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. I just want to do that for the rest of my life. I don't have, I'm not a free agent. This is what I, I I don't count this thing up that I get to be by this certain time. I've made this much, no. I just want to be about this. To testify the gospel, the grace of God. I want this to be my life legacy. My own life is not about my agenda or preferences. My course is to express the gospel of grace in whatever way it is that he has made me and given me. Now listen to what he says at the end. Remember, at the end of his course, he says, I did it. I did it. He knows he's just about to go out and have his life taken from him. And he says, I did it. I fought the good fight. I kept the faith. I I did. I finished the stinking race. I did it. There was a fight I did not avoid. There was a course I kept running, and there was a faith that I rested in and took my stand in. You know what he's talking about, right? This whole thing is is, he's taking it from the Greek games. It is a marathon. There is only one distance race that they run at this time. It is the marathon, that 26.2-mile marathon. And he's saying there is something about the stages of running a marathon that I want to equate to your life. There is something about what it feels like to start and continue and finish a 26.2 mile run that will give you a picture of what I'm taking you on in this race. I once ran a a marathon. It wasn't last year. I was 20, 28 years old. Four days after I became a believer in 1979, I went and with my best friend, Jim Adams, and his wife, we went to see the Fiesta Bowl marathon, and it blew me away. It stunned me. And I said, Jesus, I want to train for a marathon with you. I want to get to know you running along the canals and the back streets of Phoenix. Jesus, I want to talk to you and I want to hear your voice. I want to read the word before I go out and start running. And then I just want to let it percolate inside my heart. I want to run this marathon this next year. And I want to train this year getting to know you. And so I trained. I trained. I mean, at first, I, I ran in tennis shoes. I didn't even know there were running shoes. And I, I, I got shin splints, and I couldn't run. And I'm trying to learn how to run. I didn't even know what I was doing. And eventually, I got up to where I was running 50, 60 miles a week in training, and then 70, and then back to 40, and then to 80, and then 60. And I was running a ton. And Jim was doing the same. We would meet together, especially on weekends, and we would get together and put in a long, long run together and then hang out. And so the day day came of the 1980 Fiesta Bowl Marathon. Anybody who's run a marathon, it's always the same. It's just this circus at the start. Miles one through five. The race started way up in Carefree, 
if you know Phoenix and all, and ended up down at Scottsdale Community College. And the first five miles is just a circus. There's people running in chicken outfits, and, and, and you're just in this pack of people. You can't even move. At one point, my feet weren't on the ground. I'm just kind of like this, you know, just being carried along by a mob. And it's laughter, and it's so, so much fun. And everybody, people are singing and laughing. And I equate that section to when I first became a believer. Just this awesome, I can't believe you love me! And I'm getting, you know him too? Are you born again? We're going to go to, see you there or in the air. (laughs) Woo! I've got the fish sign. I'm, woo! And I remember those days. I remember those days of talking to him and letting him hear my cries and going for long walks with him and finding other people who knew him and finding my way into a church and finding out, what is this all about? How do I live this out with you? Well, at mile five, Jim looked over at me and he says, oh my gosh, look at us. This is terrible. Now it's starting to thin out a little bit. And he says... We've been running like nine minute miles. And we had trained to run a sub 330 marathon. And he says, we gotta pick it up. And I gotta tell you, we were in shape. We were buff. I'm, I was, I'd like to think of myself as life. And nobody's called me life in a long time. <laughs> but from miles six to 10, Jim looked over at me and said, let's go do this thing. And we started weaving out between different people and just We ran from miles six to 10, sub six and a half minute miles. We were just flying. It was fun. It was probably the most incredible, delightful five miles that I'd ever run. And I think of that time of that, now I'm more mature as a believer and I'm getting the permission to do things. I'm getting the permission to have my life count. And I'm talented, and I'm using my capacity, and I'm doing things like Sharky, our drama outreach to the city, and I'm, by this time, I'm preaching full-time, and I'm, I'm, I'm involved in people's lives, and I'm really getting to do the work of the ministry. It's an incredible season. I loved that season. I miss that season in a lot of ways, and I, I still think miles 6 through 10 are coming back for me. Well, that was unbelievable. Mile 12, something happened that changed everything. Jim, next to me, we're running along, and he says, I don't feel good. I said, what do you mean you don't feel good? He said, I'm going to pull out for a little bit. What do you you mean pull out? You can't pull out. I I don't feel good. I think I just need to go throw up. (laughs) I said, just throw up here. Throw up on my shoes. I don't care. And he said, no, i got to go. And he pulled away from me. I, I didn't... I had never in my mind thought that I would run this race without Jim Adams. And suddenly everything changed. That is... Hmm. Some of the people that you thought would do this life with you, they go away. And now suddenly, I didn't know what to do. I was running alone. I was, I, I, suddenly I could hear my own footsteps and I couldn't keep my pace right. And it just felt so odd and strange. As long as we were running together, it was great. Now I didn't trust. What am I doing? This doesn't make any sense. And I'm starting to get into my head. I was now in my head and that's not a good neighborhood. <laughs> I started doubting my pace. It was no longer fun. I was alone. I want to tell you, that has been the singular hardest thing for me in my race to this day, 58 years old, are the people that I thought I was going to do this thing with the whole way. Jim and I talked later. Do you know that for the whole race, we were never more than two minutes away from each other and never saw each other again for the whole race? 
Mile 15. Fatigue and pain set in. At some point, no matter how well you've trained, everything converges on you. Lactic acid starts to explode through your body and makes your legs dead. And all cells start to be deprived of oxygen. And things start locking up on you. You can't keep up on liquids. Your breathing gets labored. (coughs) Everything doesn't make sense. And now your mind starts to fatigue too because it's been holding on, trying to keep all systems together. And your heart's motivation and commitment now start to get challenged and pain starts to tell you lies and your body is willing to commit cowardice just so the pain will stop. It says, you have no business trying this. What are you doing? You're going to kill us. This pain's going to define you. You'll be irreparably damaged. It tries to convince you that what mattered so deeply minutes ago suddenly should not. It yells that you're not the kind of person who does such valiant things. Everything will be better if you will just stop running. (laughs) When you start to believe those, those are what's called in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, they're, they're called encumbrances encumbrances that I choose to put on. The, the Greek word is agkon, bulk, mass, heavy weight, thick, heavy weight. It's like choosing to zip up a park and change into cowboy boots in the middle of the run. They weigh down your heart. They make it even harder to run at a time when you're struggling most to keep running. And at a certain mile marker, every single runner gets there. It's a time when your very identity is being brought into question and you stop trusting who he says you are and who he is in you and you try to figure out everything now in isolation. You're still public, but you're isolated. And you hunker down into self-survival mode. And the embarrassment in that season turns into shame. The shame that says there is something particularly and uniquely wrong about you. And this effort to prove that you were enough is starting to prove just the opposite. So encumbrances then turn into permissions and entitlement to fail. You hear it all the time. I'm I'm processing that very thing with someone back in Phoenix right now. All of a sudden, you become the victim, blame and unforgiveness, and you feel abandoned and conspired against and defrauded and deceived and tricked and conned and duped and cheated, and you allow yourself to stew in it. You start to create a self-story and the story of what's going on around you, and it is way distorted. By the way, you guys... When our friends start to fail, do you know that they, they don't fail because they gave into temptation? You know that, right? They failed because they made some decisions back here about God in their pain. God, you don't satisfy. You don't bring me enough pleasure. God, You're holding something back from me. God, I don't think you can handle me. I've struggled with this, and I don't think you're strong enough to handle my sin. God, you failed me. You've held out on me. All that language comes from pain. And a beautiful friend or mentor or discipler doesn't just try to get that person right here to stop this this behavior in in the moment. He goes way back here and ministers to those three statements to get to the heart of what brought that person to put on that heavy parka in the middle of the race. It's interesting, you know, I, I am a huge sovereignty of God person. And we say that God is the one who does it in you, but, but you, you know, you know, you have a choice of whether you're going to allow him to or not. You decide what your legacy is, what is going to be and what generational patterns you'll leave behind and what beauty you get to experience and what healing and what lives you'll affect. 
God is sovereign and he adores me beyond all telling, but I have the choice to wallow in my encumbrances and give myself permission to allow me to sin and it will begin to frame my destiny. You do not want to allow anything to fester you. You don't want to clutch onto anything like a child not being cared of. You don't want to hold on to grudges. You don't have the energy to hide anything. You don't want to hurt to you don't want any hurt to cause you to cover up or blame other runners. You don't want to grieve in dishonesty. You don't want to live in fantasy. Mile 16, I went down. I literally fell down. I'd had an issue in my hips with potassium. They would lock up with me sometimes on long runs, and sometimes they didn't, but on this run they did. And at mile 16, I literally fell down on the ground, and I couldn't get up. Right at that moment, one of those trucks comes by, and you just it's a pitiful thing. The runners who couldn't make it, they're in that truck, and they... Nobody's making eye contact with anyone. <laughs> and I'm, I'm laying there on the ground going, oh, gosh, I don't want to go in there. <laughs> and the guy, the guy has a hat on who says, hey, get in, buddy. And it's got horns on it. And I go, I ain't getting in there. <laughs> okay, that man, is, that man is Satan. I'm not going in there. <laughs> laying there on the ground at mile 16... For the first time in the race, in the middle of my pain, I remembered why I was running this. And I sat there with runners going by and I went, oh yeah, I, I started this whole thing not for this day, not for this race, not to run a sub 330. I ran it to to let you love me and to play with you and to talk to you and to know you. It's been an incredible year, God. I love you. I don't care what happens here. I don't want to get in that truck, but if I have to, I'm okay. That's why he puts that in that statement. When those encumbrances hit, in that moment that you become aware of it, Fix your eyes on Jesus. Look at him. Look at him. Look at who he says you are. Look at how he says, as my father loves me to the exact extent, I'm crazy about you. And nothing's changed between us. Literally, it means to turn the eyes away from every other thing, every other racer, that truck with those runners and the guy with the hat. And fix them unto him. To see this, that I am never alone. Because he chose to run the race before me. Alone. He knows every single sadness and fear and loneliness. And now he runs it with you, ahead of you, for you. He kept running in the dark for the joy of what was ahead. This will not be endless. This, there is joy ahead. He endured so I could stand in his endurance, which is now mine. He not only despised, but he bore all my shame so that all that self-story, I don't have to tell myself anymore because it died at that cross. He redeemed me from it on that cross. He's seen my finish line. And he says, kid, I've done it. This current pain, this current loss cannot defeat you or define you. His smile says, this has not taken me by surprise, kid. I'm in control of this too. I'm enough. I will not go away. This changes nothing with us. And then he says, now just stay on my shoulder. The very first race I ran, a 10K, I, I, I didn't know how to run it. And, I, and there was a very good runner that I was with. And I said, how do I do this? And he says, just do this. You don't have to run the race. Just stay on my shoulder. Just look at my shoulder, and all you have to do is follow my shoulder. And I did. That's all I did that whole race. I just, I just stayed on his shoulder. And he ran the race for me. I still made the steps. Just stay on my shoulder, kid. Do you know that I have no memory of those next 
couple miles in the race. I just, I just was with the author of my race, shuffling in sacred, sustained purpose. I will never forget that stretch of the race. Mile 20. I had strategically, before the race, I was a school teacher at Arcadia High School in Phoenix, and I had strategically decided to place Jerry Suarez at mile 20 because I knew that I would be a mess and I would need his encouragement. So he said, I will run alongside you for about a mile. So at mile 20, I'm running now about like this. I'm not well at all. I'm in a haze, just in a fog. I don't know where I am. And Jerry runs up alongside me and says, How are we doing, boss? <laughs> okay. <laughs> don't, you're not saying anything. You okay? And I can't say anything. I, I just don't even know that I heard him. And he says, Okay, so let me tell you this. You told me that I was supposed to encourage you and not let you stop. And I just want to tell you that you, you're the one who brought me to know Jesus. And you're my hero. And I don't know where I would be if there wasn't you. And I am so proud to be your friend. And I can't, even if you don't make it, um, it's okay. I just wanted to tell you that. I've never told you that. You're my hero. I'll carry you if you want, whatever you want. I will stay with you as long as you want. And he did that with me for the next mile and a half. Just saying these beautiful words to me to remind me who I was and who I was to him. Jerry's what they call in verse 1 a witness. Maturos. A witness is brought in to tell you what he has seen that you cannot presently see yourself. About you, about your God. Biblical witnesses, there are historical witnesses, there are previous generational witnesses, there are peer witnesses sitting right next to you, there are next generational witnesses. And they witness this, he's good. I want to tell you what you can't see at the moment. He's good all the time in the beautiful, heroic times and the horribly mind-numbing, painful times. You see, why does he bring that up in Hebrews 11? Because there is a profound statistical advantage when you are in your home stadium competing in front of your own fans. They can hear you cheering. You and I need to hear the cheering of the saints of this faith who have gone before. We need to hear the cheering of a generation ahead of us, of those who are running their race right next to us. I need to know I'm not alone, that I'm not the only one going through this. That's what a maturus does. That's why it says this in Galatians. Such a powerful statement. Bear each other's burdens, carry each other, stand next to each other like Jerry stood next to me. And when you do that, you'll fulfill the law of Christ. All you have to do is stand there, take the heat, enter in, hold this person, love them and not go. And he says, when you do that, you are fulfilling the one law, not the 11th commandment, but the one law that you are now designed to do to love each other. You have the heart for it. And the powerful reality about it is this is love. And in helping me run my race, you're running your race. And carrying my burdens actually makes you run with more ease and grace and speed. But none of them can know what's going on until you come out of hiding until you choose to admit that you put on that heavy woolen coat and it's embarrassing to tell but once you tell you'll feel free I know I've just been there you guys just a month ago I was running well and I got overwhelmed with pain with disappointment and I covered up and I listened to pain, to pain and chose to stay there alone I hunkered down and I got sadder and sadder in that self-attended lonely place I forgot that I was in a race and I put on heavy clothes and eventually I'm just sitting there and I can't help you run your race and that's the only thing that ever allowed this life to make any sense to me was helping you run your race but I had to be willing to give up this self-pity and the stubbornness of refusing to trust God 
the pouting, the blame. And you have to trust God with your sadness, running the risk that nothing will change. But the spell is broken the moment I realize it's not randomness. The punchline to a cruel joke. The evil has not won. This stretch of race where God's being more... In this stretch of race, God's being most glorified. And his love is being accessed. And I'm learning dependence upon him now that I really need it. So, I take the coat off. I lace up my shoes and I look into his face and I thank him for how he's gotten me so wonderfully far in the course. And I stretch and I start running again. And all the weight goes away and I breathe in the joy of doing what I was meant to do. Love. I was meant for this. I never wanted anything to ever rob me of it again. I can't waste one more moment. Mile 23. Whoo! There is nothing like mile 23. You're doing this. And you think you're sprinting. (laughs) And here's what you discover. There's a bunch of other people around you, like eight or ten, who are going through the same thing, and you suddenly find each other. And they are all limping, and one of them... All you can hear is the sound of rubber hitting the asphalt. Just people stumbling and shuffling. Nobody's lifting their feet. Finally, someone looks over at you and says, How you doing? And you go, I can't feel my legs. And then someone comes up next to you and goes, I think I just peed myself. (laughs) This is true, you guys. While we were doing this, a guy ran past us with a t-shirt on the, on the back of it said, Wish me happy birthday. I'm 78 years old today. <laughs> Do you know who this group is? They are mostly broken and tried, and true, and fragile, and wonderfully safe, and alive, and free, and fun. And God has given them to you to replace the ones that went away. And they are beautiful. They are real. And you don't find them just at mile 23. You'll find them when you're in your 20s, and your 30s, and 40s. And they are not who you would expect. And so one of them says to me, and says to all of us, Hey, um, what do you, th- <clears throat> what do you think? Why don't we pick it up a little bit and just try to race this thing in with some courage? And we all do. For, at least we have the illusion of feeling like we're lifting <laughs> our feet. And I want to tell you, that stretch of running is the finest stretch of running that you will ever do in your whole life. That section right there. Mile 25, I can start to make out the crowd at the finish line, and I actually do, with this group, pick up my pace. It's what Paul says. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, is going to award to me on that day. And not only to me, but all who have loved his appearing. He can imagine this victory stand where the one who righteously can alone see what I've been going through will award to me on that day, and that's what I'm running for. So tonight, as we start this weekend together, my dear brothers, there is a race, and it transcends and surpasses any other goal, and others have run it already. And you're not the first to feel this pain. And at some point in this race, you'll become overwhelmed. I promise you, if you haven't already. And if you listen to the lie of pain and get stuck and put on the heavy encumberment at any moment, the moment you first realize it, turn your head and look at him. Look at Jesus Christ. And let, let witnesses in, like tonight, in your small group, 
to remind you again who you are. Let them help take off the coat. They cannot wait for you to ask. It's time for us to start running again. <laughs>